Jesus was born for the purpose of dying. Now, his only connection to the flesh is now at the bottom of the cross, begging him not to die. Satan has been crushed by Jesus, so I'm no longer really fighting all these demons and devils and all this stuff. The Bible says that now my struggle is the flesh. And what's usually happening is not what's happening because the angels know something she doesn't know and Jesus knows something she doesn't know. John 19, who is that guy in that suit? I do not recognize him, huh? So we're at the cross scene. I don't know if we realize how graphic this is. We tend to get familiar with things over a while, and when you get familiar, things lose meaning. Just ask a marriage that's got familiar. It loses its meaning. Anything that gets familiar, it robs you of honor and it robs you of meaning. And I think we've heard it so many times, we don't really get the depth and the, how graphic the scene is that's taking place right in front of us. There stood by the cross, Jesus, a cross of Jesus, his mother. And his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Now, you gotta understand, all this Messiah stuff and Son of God stuff aside, she is Mary's baby. That's her boy. She carried him. She had to run while they were trying to take his life. She felt the scorn of all the rumors of how he came to be. She raised him up. She oversaw him. She groomed him to be the kind of man that he is. And everybody else is talking about Jesus, the Son of God, and death and resurrection. All she knows is she is at the foot of a cross out of her mind with grief. And she has watched her baby boy be beaten unrecognizable. She's seen him them take turns taking a staff and beat him in the head. They have taken the, the hairs from his beard and just pulled the hairs out of his skin. They have forced a crown down into his skull and he can't even open his eyes because the blood is stinging the eyes that's running down, but he can't get his hands away to wipe his eyes because they're nailed. Not that, that's just talking about the physicality of what's going on. Now the Bible says that he became sin for us. So everything everybody would ever do sinful, every cruddy thing about us, every twisted thing about us, every carnal thing about us, for all humanity, for every generation, he became that. And he was suspended between heaven and earth, and earth was mocking him, and God in heaven turned his head. Nobody will even look at him but mama. And mama's down at the foot of the cross. Oh, please don't die. Baby, please don't leave me. Don't go from me. Please don't die. Jesus, look at me. Look at me. Don't close your eyes. Look at me. She's wooing him back to life. Now, next verse, please, 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, we think that that's John, standing by, he said to his mother, woman, notice he didn't call her mom. He had for a moment to divorce himself from the sentimentalism of their relationship. Woman, behold your son. Next verse. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Thank you, Terrence. I appreciate it. This is an extremely graphic scene. There's some points I want to build in the Easter narrative. And then I want to end with what actually went on those three days while we know that he was buried in the tomb. The first thing I want you to know is Mary was Jesus' only connection to the flesh. 
Jesus was not born of the seed of a man. He was born of the seed of God. All the way back in Genesis 3, at the fall of Adam and Eve, all the way back at the fall, God came on the scene. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that chapter next week. God came on the scene and he said, I can fix this. I've already got a plan. He said, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. So Adam has not even got the taste of that apple out of his mouth. And God says, I already had a plan to fix it for you messed it up. But he said, the seed of a woman, here's the thing, a woman doesn't have seed. So what did that mean? How in knowing that she was, has never known a man, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she conceived and bore a son and we called him Emmanuel, God with us. His name shall be Jesus. So that word overshadowed is actually a procreation term, actually an intimate lovemaking term where the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and in that moment she conceived the seed of God and now he was born of heaven from the seed of God but he was of the flesh from the womb of Mary. Being the perfect God man. Jesus is not 50-50. Jesus is 100-100. He is fully God and he is fully man. He is God with us. Okay, that's what the word Emmanuel means, God with us. And that's what the angel called him at, the, at his birth, Emmanuel, God with us. So we know that he was of the seed of God. Why? Because we know that the male determines the bloodline. And the bloodline, because it was his blood that was going to be shed for sins, could not be defiled. So it had to be precious blood. It had to be unblemished blood. It could not be regular blood because it had to be untouched by sin and the sin nature which all of mankind was dealing with. So Mary was responsible for giving the Son of God a body to live in. Everything else came from heaven. Okay? Now, his only connection to the flesh is now at the bottom of the cross begging him not to die. Dilemma. He was sent to die. Jesus was born for the purpose of dying. And his mama is at the foot of the cross, please don't die. Not understanding that she is for at least a moment standing in the way. She has been now become a hurdle. She has now become a stumbling block for God's almighty, infinite plan of salvation for all mankind. And she's at the bottom. Why? Because the Bible says that our struggle in this day and time, that Satan has been crushed by Jesus. So I'm no longer really fighting all these demons and devils and all this stuff. The Bible says that now my struggle is the flesh. That my flesh wars against me. That my flesh wars against my mind. And in my spirit, I delight in the law of God, Romans 7 and Romans chapter 8. So on the inside where I've been born again, I want to follow God. But the Bible says every time I want to do good, evil is right there present with me. And it means that this shell, this flesh, it has passions. And I don't need a demon to mess up my future. All I need is a flesh. The people with the most jacked up lives in the world are people that say yes to their flesh every time it wants something. Your flesh has the ability to destroy your life before supper with no help from a devil at all. <laughs> and the flesh is wooing him back to life. Don't die. Don't die. So look what Jesus does. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. What he's saying is, mama, go home and let me die. Second point, why? Because as long as you're talking, I can't die. Amen. Now, let's move to the next part of this. Verses 28 through 30. Verses 28 through 30. It's all I can do to keep this coat on. <laughs> <laughs> After
after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled. Ah. Mama, flesh, you got to go home. Now, all things have been accomplished. I took care of the flesh. Last thing to die. That the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Verse 29. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it into his mouth. Verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Ooh, ooh, big one. Wise people can move from number one to number two. They know what God wants and they know how to set a course. For every vision, there is a vehicle. So what vehicle do you have to build to fulfill your purpose? Depending on the assignment on your life, things you get approached with might not be wrong, but are they wise for you to get involved in? In this teaching, Wisdom Society, Ron Carpenter will share with you how to gain knowledge beyond your years. See, God never calls you by what you are. God never calls you by what you used to be. That's people that do that. He comes in and speaks to your future, and that future begins to give you a framework of who you can be. Somebody shout if you know there's more. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. We are so honored to be able to come into your house today, wherever you are, wherever you're, you're tuning in from all over the world. I'm just so blessed to be a part of this ministry, Ron Carpenter Television, who happens to be my husband, who I think carries such a powerful, anointing and amazing word. I know it's touched your life. So thank you so much for letting us come into your life today. Well, you've been a part of Ron Carpenter Ministries longer than anybody. You've yes, I have, and I'm so years. grateful. I just want to ask you one question. Has, has this ministry blessed your life? Uh, there, there's something that Hope and I believe strongly in. Everybody here at Ron Carpenter Ministries is. And that, that means give to the thing that gives to you. We want everything around us to remain strong. If it gives to us, we want to give back. Absolutely. And Hope and I have always tried to operate not just in generosity, but in radical generosity, radical obedience. There might be some times we've missed him, but for the most part, we've yeah. tried to obey him. And I just want to ask you, if this is something that has touched you, we don't advertise, we don't have ads, we don't do any of that. It's just the people who love the Word of God, <laughs> the Kingdom of God, and this global mission to get this Word to as many people as possible. Would you help us do what we do? There's an army of people that have been doing it for years, weeks, months, decades. Yeah. I say thank you. But for those of you who say, I want to be a part of this, well, whether it's a one-time gift of any amount or whether you become a monthly partner and a part of this family for any amount, we have this wonderful gift that we want to send to you to say thank you. It's not a repayment, but it just lets you know we value you and your partnership with us. We've also got the vault. Yes, it's Which so is a good. monthly subscription to everything in our archive. And they can go and get these messages if they want the whole service in our online bookstore. Right. All this stuff's available. But whatever it is that you would like for us to do, we try to serve you as best we can. Would you help us as we try to take the gospel over the whole earth? Now, I'm going to be quiet here. Why? I want to get back to the word. Remember, the Bible says you were chosen before the foundations of the earth were laid. That's hard for us to wrap our mind around because all we know is time. We know past, present, and future. We live in it. Our lives are dictated by it. You got to understand God is not in time. Time is in God. In the beginning, in other words, when the beginning started ticking, when the clock started, in the beginning, God. God was already there. We know when time started. We know it's going to end. 
But God is not bound to time. He's not bound to space. If he were, he would cease to be God. So in the beginning, God, and the Bible says that in Ephesians 2, that God had a meeting. You know who he invited? Himself. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? He sought after the counsel of his will. <laughs> he met with himself and said, what do you want to do, self? <laughs> Go read it. It's Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. It talks about it all right there. Okay. And sometime or another, and I don't know when, and that's way above my scholarly grade. God had a meeting, and in that meeting, all the acts of God were completed. In that meeting, the lamb was slain. Jesus was not slain because Adam screwed up. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. So God already had a plan in place knowing we were going to screw it up. Not only was the lamb slain in that meeting, but you and I were in the lamb because we were chosen in him before the foundations. See, that makes you look at... So when God started... He already had his plan. He'd already had his meeting. So when Jesus said, it is finished, what does that mean? That means everything in the heavens and in the unseen realm has now been completed. Amen. You got to understand, God does not look at your life like you do. You know yesterday, you know what's happening right now, and you don't have a clue about tomorrow. Okay. God is not past, present, and future. God is I am. Amen. Moses said, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me? I don't even know what your name is. God said, you go tell him I am sent you. In other words, I'm not was, I'm not shall be. I'm in a constant state of am. I'm am all the time. They said, are you greater than our father Abraham? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Hallelujah, I love that kind of stuff. So, Jesus said it's finished, meaning everything has been completed in the unseen realm, but it has to come in the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. It's finished in heaven. It has to come in the earth. Your life is finished in heaven, but it has to come in the earth. And whether or not you live out, your destiny will not be up to God. It will be up to you. God is the architect of your life. You are the executioner. So when you ask God, when you pray about something, God doesn't jump up and go do it. It is finished. So that's why I tell you, you don't ask for things. You declare what he already said is yours. No, it's not, Lord, would you deliver me? He has already delivered you. So now take the keys of the kingdom and walk in your deliverance. Lord, would you heal me? He's already been beaten across his back, and by his stripes you were healed. Now take the keys of the kingdom and walk out your healing. It's not, we got to quit asking God to do things we got the keys to. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> you don't have a... The only time Jesus stood up is recorded, in, I want to say Acts, it's Acts chapter 9, I think. Say so Acts chapter 7 or Acts chapter 9. Stephen, the martyr, was testifying of Jesus, and he died for his faith. And the people got so mad at him for standing up for Jesus, they took, back in the days, they'd stone you because they thought it was blasphemy. And they picked up stones and began beating his body with blocks. And the Bible said he stood there and praised God. His body was being pelted with bricks and he stand there praising God. And the Bible says and at that time the heavens opened up and Jesus was standing right there. The only thing that gets Jesus to stand up is when you can take your persecution and praise him anyhow. When you can take your difficulty and keep praising him. When you can go through hell and back and you never stop praising him. So the next time the enemy comes against you, you need to be the first one down here shouting. You need to be the first one down here running, jumping, dancing, spinning, because when you can praise through your dilemma, Jesus will stand up. Ow, I'm about to run all over this building. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hey. Yep. 
Y'all can't clap in here and tell me, preach on preacher, then get in the car and talk bad about me. <laughs> I want to finish. Can I finish? I'm, I'm trying to set you, I want, I want to walk you through this. I got two more things. I, I was going to skip to the last one, but it ain't going to be right if I do it. John 20. So now we've graduated from John 19, now we're in John 20. We're dealing with the account of John. There are four accounts of Jesus, of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in John's account. Different ones of them saw different aspects, okay? Now on the first day of the week, in other words, he's died Friday. First day of the week is Sunday, not Monday. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Who was Mary Magdalene? Remember, he cast seven devils out of her. To them who've been forgiven much, loveth much. She went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. <coughs> she saw two angels, <coughs> pardon me, in white, sitting one at the head, another at the feet, where the Jesus of body had lain, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Like, what's up? Why are you so tore up? I mean, me paraphrasing, I mean, the angels are sitting back eating a Reese cup and drinking a Coke. I mean, they're fine. And Mary's sitting there tore up. And the, the angels ask her, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't know it was him. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So she, he asked her the same thing. She must have really been snotting away. I mean, running it down her arm and everything. <laughs> Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me. Oh, there's a message in that. I got to leave that alone. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to the brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Okay, this one and one more. I'll go as fast as I can. The third thing I want you to realize here is that usually what you see is not what's real. I have done everything in my four and a half years here to teach as much as I could that there's the realm that you can see and there's the realm you can't. And the Bible is very plain that the one you can't see is dictating the one you can. You've got to understand that rarely does a blessing show up looking like a blessing. A blessing don't knock on the door and say, hey, I'm a blessing. Opportunities usually don't show up looking like opportunities. <laughs> Me and Hope could chronicle to you some of the greatest days in our life came on the heels of some of the worst days of our life. I sure didn't see them days as, oppor as opportunities. Thought I was dying. She thought she would never, never bounce back. And all of a sudden, we found out the whole time it wasn't a wall, it was a door. You see what I'm talking about? Doors don't always show up looking like doors. She sees an empty tomb. A man who set her free is gone. There's been a lot of conspiracies about her body. They upgraded the guards because they'd already turned, already said he was going to rise again. And they said, we don't want people to come steal his body and everybody think he's risen again. Even Rome was afraid of this. Well, and that was the greatest empire on the planet. So she comes to the tomb and sure enough, something's happened. He's gone. She's crying. She sees it. She draws a conclusion and has an emotional response. But the angels ain't crying. Jesus ain't crying. Because what's going on is not what's going on. And I want to submit to you, 
What you see in front of you is not really what's happening. God is orchestrating things whew, in a realm that you can't see. God is aligning things. God is repairing things. God is moving people around. And while you're playing checkers, God's playing chess. Come on. He's forming this thing for the long term. All you know is what's happening right now, and you're freaking out over what's happening right now. But God's been making moves a long time to put you in the seat of victory and make sure you end up at your destiny. And you got to understand, just because you see difficulty don't mean it's difficulty. Come on, somebody. Just because it looks like it's falling apart don't mean it's falling apart. And what's usually happening is not what's happening happening because the angels know something she doesn't know and Jesus knows something she doesn't know. Shout amen. Thank you so much for letting us come into your home and share this time with you today. You know what? You may be out there and say, I don't know this Jesus. And you sure seem to be excited about him, Pastor Ron. And I looked around in the service and it seemed like everybody else was, but I'm not experiencing that right now. You know what? Jesus will come and live on the inside of yes, you. Yes, he will. He will be your friend that never leaves, friend that sticks closer than a brother, a present help in a time of trouble. When you're in trouble and everybody else runs away, he runs to you. I would love for you to know him. The prayer goes something like this. If you'd like to accept him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus, I believe you paid the price for my sins. I believe you died and rose again for my salvation. Come live in my heart. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I'm sorry for all that I've done wrong. I pray that my sins would die and my new life would be yes. resurrected in you. Make my heart your home from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we want to hear from you now. So you've got to write in, you've got to email us, you've got to call us. All that information at the bottom, you've got to use some of it. Why? Because we want to know that you made this decision. Congratulations. And to everyone from Ron Carpenter Ministries, until next time, God bless you. We love you. Wise people can move from number one to number two. They know what God wants and they know how to set a course. For every vision, there is a vehicle. So what vehicle do you have to build to fulfill your purpose? Depending on the assignment on your life, things you get approached with might not be wrong, but are they wise for you to get involved in? In this teaching, Wisdom Society, Ron Carpenter will share with you how to gain knowledge beyond your years. See, God never calls you by what you are. God never calls you by what you used to be. That's people that do that. He comes in and speaks to your future, and that future begins to give you a framework of who you can be. Somebody shout if you know there's more. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now, and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call 1-888-259-8200. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.